Welcome to your personalized deep dive. Oh, I like that. Today we're... Um, Sounds exciting. Yeah. Cracking open a collection of academic research papers. Oh, wow. From the Proceedings of the International Conference of Aerospace and Mechanical Engineering 2019. Okay. Get this. We're talking about making airplanes more eco-friendly. Interesting. Designing aircraft that seem straight out of a sci-fi movie. Ooh. Robots that do the dirty work. Okay. And even building things with plant fibers. I am intrigued. Where do we even begin? Yeah. Let's start with something we all think about these days. Okay. The environmental impact of flying. Yeah. One of these papers okay. looks at Abha International Airport in Saudi Arabia okay. and how they're trying to shrink their carbon footprint. So it highlights a crucial question yeah. we're all facing. Yeah. How do we keep up with the growing demand for air travel mm -hmm. without harming the planet? Right. This airport, yeah. like many others, mm -hmm. relies heavily on planes like the Airbus A320 and Boeing 737, right. which are workhorses. Yeah. But... Let's face it, yeah. not the greenest options. And it's not like they can just oh, switch I... to a totally different type of plane overnight. No. Right? Things like runway length limit what kinds of aircraft they can handle. Exactly. Even though they're expanding to accommodate larger planes, right. the core problem remains. Yeah. How do you make those flights more sustainable? The researchers looked at different ways mm -hmm. to offset the airport's emissions. Oh, okay. But they also made it clear yeah. that... We need more innovative solutions, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to fuel. Which brings us to another paper oh. that dives deep into alternative aviation fuels. Interesting. What's the deal with these? Like, Can they really make flying greener? They have huge potential. Okay. But it's not as simple as just swapping out jet fuel for something else. Right. This paper gets into the nitty gritty of how huh. these fuels actually burn in an engine. Okay. Something called spray characteristics. Spray characteristic. It turns out the way fuel breaks down into tiny droplets mm -hmm. and burns mm -hmm. directly impacts uh, how efficient uh, and clean the engine is. So it's not just about finding a fuel that's renewable. Right. It has to work well with the engines we already have. Exactly. Okay. The researchers looked at things like penetration length. Okay. Which is how far the fuel stray travels mm -hmm. into the combustion chamber. Right. And spray morphology morphology basically the shape and structure oh, of the fuel spray got it all of these factors mm -hmm. play a role mm -hmm. in making sure the fuel burns completely and efficiently okay so greener fuels are one piece of the puzzle yeah but what about designing totally new types of aircraft right one paper introduces this wild idea okay of a tricopter tilt rotor aircraft Tricopter tilt rotor aircraft. It's like a mashup of a helicopter and an airplane. Okay. It can take off and land vertically. Right. But also fly long distances efficiently. Yeah. Wow. It's a clever concept. Yeah. That addresses some of the drawbacks. Okay. Of existing tilt rotor aircraft. Okay. You see, traditional tilt rotor designs. Yeah. Can be tricky to handle during auto rotation. Right. That's the emergency procedure. Yeah. If an engine fails. Okay. And they can also be unstable. Oh. When landing yeah. this tricopter configuration yeah, okay. with two tilting rotors in the front mm -hmm. and a fixed rotor in the back okay. is designed to be more stable and reliable. It sounds incredibly complex. It is. Did the researchers actually build one of these things? Not quite. Okay. But they did create a computer model okay. to simulate how this tricopter would perform right. in different flight modes. So it's theoretical at this point. It is a huge step yeah. towards turning this seemingly outlandish idea right. into a reality. Speaking of unconventional aircraft, okay. another paper caught my eye. Right. It's all about winging ground, wig craft. These things fly really close to the surface mm. using something called the ground effect Okay. to boost, lift, and reduce drag. Mm -hmm. Imagine a craft that skims just above the water. Yeah. Super efficient, right? Exactly. Yeah. And the research we're looking at okay. explores how to make wig craft mm -hmm. even more aerodynamically efficient Okay. by using something called micro vortex generators. Micro vortex generators. Or MVGs. And MVGs, okay. Think of them as tiny bumps place strategically yeah, right. on the craft surface okay. to create tiny swirls of air okay. that actually help to reduce drag. Hold on. Yeah. Tiny bumps make it more aerodynamic. It might seem that way. It does. Yeah. But the researchers used a 3D printed model oh, okay. of a wig craft to test yeah. different MVG configurations. Okay. 
their experiments showed that these tiny additions mm. can actually significantly reduce drag. Really? Potentially leading to better fuel efficiency. Wow. And longer range. Mm. So less drag means better fuel efficiency. Exactly. And longer range. That's it. That's amazing. Pretty neat, huh? Yeah. It's amazing how yeah. something so small yeah. can have such a big impact. Okay, time to shift gears. I'll go. And dive into the world of robots. Right. One of these papers tackles a less glamorous but still important challenge. Could be. Inspecting and cleaning air ducts. So I know it might not sound as exciting as yeah. flying cars or robots on Mars, right. but it's a great example yeah. of how robots can solve practical problems. Yeah, air ducts are tricky. Exactly. And potentially dangerous for humans to access. Right. So robots are the perfect solution. Makes sense. So how are these robots designed to navigate those tight spaces yeah. and actually do the cleaning? The research explores two main approaches. Okay. The first is a wall press design. Wall press. Okay. Where the robot essentially clings to the inside of the duct. Okay. And uses extendable arms to clean. It's kind of like a robotic inchworm. Clever. Yeah. And what's the other approach? The second design is more like a robotic Roomba. Okay. It's a wheeled robot equipped with brushes okay. that scrub the inside of the duct Got it. as it moves along. I love how they went into all the design details. Yeah. Things like how the robots move, mm. their sensing systems, yeah. and even how they're controlled. Yeah. They even use 3D printing to build prototypes. Oh, cool. It really highlights how important prototyping and testing are oh yeah in the design process absolutely and it shows how robotics is evolving yeah to handle all sorts of challenging environments right all right ready to talk about some really cool materials sure get this we're talking about composites made with natural fibers like flax oh wow i mean who knew you could build things with plants it's a fascinating area of research. Yeah. Natural fiber composites have some big advantages oh. over traditional materials. Like what? They're sustainable. Okay. Lightweight. Mm -hmm. And can be less expensive. Right. This particular research yeah. looked at a composite okay. made with flax fibers mm -hmm. and a type of plastic called polypropylene. Polypropylene. Okay. Yeah. Um, so they mixed flax with plastic. They did. Oh, and they get did this. Enough. They also added tiny particles of silica, huh? which is essentially a type of sand, sand okay. to the mix. Okay. And you get this by adding the silica and flax fibers. Yeah. They were able to make the composite mm. significantly stronger and more durable. So you're telling me that adding sand and plant fibers to plastic I am. makes it super strong. It does. That's mind blowing. It really is. Yeah. And think about the applications. Yeah. This type of composite could be used in everything mm -hmm. from cars and airplanes right. to furniture and even buildings. Wow, that's amazing. It's a great example of how we can use natural materials. To create high-performance, sustainable products. This is all so fascinating. Yeah. I'm good. already starting to see how all these different areas of research are connected. Right. But before we move on, yeah. I'm curious, all this talk about making aviation greener is great. Yeah. But what about electric planes? That's a great question. Is that even a realistic possibility? And it's something a lot of people are excited about. Yeah. Electric cars have taken off. Right. So why not electric planes? Exactly. The challenge lies in battery technology. Right. Batteries are heavy. Yes, they are. And planes need a lot of energy. Yeah. To get off the ground and stay in the air. Exactly. So are electric planes just a pipe dream then? Not necessarily. Okay. While we might not see jumbo jets powered solely by batteries mm -hmm. crossing oceans anytime soon, okay. electric propulsion could be a game changer okay. for shorter flights, mm -hmm. regional travel, okay. and even urban air taxis. Interesting. Plus, there's a ton of research going on right. to improve battery technology. Yeah. So who knows what the future holds? I'm definitely keeping my fingers crossed for electric planes. Me too. Speaking of things that make a lot of noise. Okay. One paper dives into a technology called a bias acoustic liner. Bias acoustic liner. It's designed to reduce noise okay. from jet engines, mm -hmm. which is a huge problem yeah. for people living near airports. Exactly. So it's a clever solution. Mm -hmm. Imagine a special lining okay. placed inside the engine's casing. Mm -hmm. This liner has tiny holes okay. that allow air to flow through. Right. And that airflow disrupts the sound waves. Oh. Right. making the engine quieter 
Interesting. So it's not just about blocking the sound. Right. It's about manipulating the airflow yeah. to make it less noisy. To reduce the noise. Pretty ingenious. Very. But wait, there's more. Oh. This paper also talks about how these liners can help with something completely different. Okay. Preventing ice buildup on planes. Ice buildup on planes. Okay. It turns out you can strategically direct hot air mm -hmm. through these liners okay. to heat up critical surfaces, mm -hmm. like the engine's inlet, right. preventing ice from forming. So they're multi-purpose. Talk about a multitasker. It is. That's incredible. It is. One technology, two important benefits. Two for one. Okay, remember how we were talking about composites made with natural fibers? I do. Well, another paper focuses on a different plant fiber. Okay. Canaf. Canaf. Apparently, it's super strong and sustainable. So canaf is amazing stuff. It yeah. grows quickly. Okay. And it's much more environmentally friendly right. than traditional materials like glass or carbon fiber. Okay. This research looked at using canaf fibers mm -hmm. to reinforce a bioplastic okay. called polylactic acid mm -hmm. or PLA. PLA. PLA is made from renewable resources like cornstarch. So you're telling me they made a super strong material out of plants? Yes. That's awesome. And they used a technique called filament winding. Filament winding, okay. To create these canaf PLA composites. Mm. Basically, they wound the canaf fibers yeah. around a mold Got to it. create a strong, lightweight structure. Wow. The possibilities are endless. Yeah. Think lightweight parts for cars. Okay. Durable consumer goods. Mm -hmm. Even eco-friendly building materials. Wow. It's a great example of how sustainable materials yeah. can really make a difference. This is all so cool. Yeah. And it makes me wonder what other innovative solutions are out there just waiting to be discovered. Right. But before we get ahead of ourselves, okay. let's talk about something that's already revolutionizing manufacturing 3D printing. 3D printing, okay. One of these papers looks at how 3D printing is being used mm. to create something called sandwich structures. Sandwich structures. Sandwich structures are a clever way to create lightweight but strong materials. Okay. Imagine two outer layers, Okay. like slices of bread, with a core material in between, okay, like the filling of a sandwich. Oh, I see. This creates a structure that's strong and stiff, right? But also very light. Okay. So, like an airplane wing or a wind turbine blade. Exactly. Yeah. And three D printing allows you to create yeah incredibly complex sandwich structures, right? With intricate internal designs mm -hmm. that would be impossible to build with traditional methods. Right. You can even tailor the properties oh, yeah. of each layer mm -hmm. to meet specific needs. Okay. A stiff outer skin, right. a lightweight core for insulation, Okay. and so on. So it's not just about making something quickly. No. It's about creating structures that are optimized for performance. Exactly. That's pretty incredible. It is. 3D printing is changing the way we think about design and manufacturing yeah. in a big way. Absolutely. Okay, let's ride this wave of innovation okay, and yeah. talk about another cool idea. Right. Harnessing energy from ocean waves. Oh, wow. One of these papers focuses on a device right. called a backward bent duct buoy or BBDB for short. BBDB. Yeah. Ocean waves are packed with energy yeah. and BBDDs offer a promising way yeah. to tap into that power. I see. Picture a floating buoy mm. with a duct that's bent backwards. Okay. Kind of like a sea serpent. Right. With its mouth facing the oncoming waves as yeah. the waves rush in. Yeah. They force air through the duct, mm -hmm. spinning a turbine and generating electricity. It's like capturing the power of the ocean's breath. That's a great way to put it. But I imagine there are yeah. a lot of challenges right. in designing a device that can withstand yeah. the harsh conditions of the ocean. Absolutely. The researchers in this paper mm -hmm. looked at various BD, BDB designs right. and highlighted the importance of considering things like yeah. wave patterns, okay. water depth, mm -hmm. and the potential impact on marine life. Right. It's a reminder that while we're eager to find new energy sources, right. we need to do it responsibly. Yes. And sustainably. Exactly. Sustainability is key. Absolutely. Okay, I'm ready for another mind-bending concept. Okay. This paper explores how a GQ can be used GQ. to analyze airplane arrival delays. Airplane arrival delays. Okay. okay. GQ. Yeah. Is that some kind of top secret airport technology? Not quite. Okay. It's actually a mathematical framework okay. that helps us understand yeah. the complex world of airport operations. Okay. You see, planes don't always arrive oh. 
exactly on time. Right. There's a degree of randomness involved. Right. There's a lot of factors. Yeah. Weather delays. Yeah. Air traffic control decisions. Right. Even things like gate availability oh, yeah. can cause delays. So a GQ helps to predict those delays. It is. That sounds incredibly useful. By understanding the factors that contribute to delays. Right. And the inherent uncertainty in airport operations. Right. We can make better decisions. Or about. About scheduling. Okay. allocating resources, oh, yeah. and even improving infrastructure. Wow. So it has ripple effects yeah. across the whole system. It's all about making air travel smoother and more efficient. Okay, let's talk about something that sounds super high-tech. Okay. Ceramic matrix composites okay. or CMCs. CMCs. Okay. What are those and why should we care? CMCs are a game changer for applications Okay. where things get really hot. Oh, okay. Like jet engine components. Okay. Rocket nozzles. Right. Or even heat shields. For spacecraft. Oh, wow. They're incredibly strong. Yeah. And can withstand extreme temperatures. So basically, they're the superheroes of materials. Pretty much. Yeah. But making CMCs is a tricky process. Okay. It involves combining ceramic fibers. Okay. With a ceramic matrix. Right. And you have to make sure the fibers are evenly distributed. Right. And there are no defects. That could weaken the material. Right. This paper looked at using a technique yeah. called filament winding to create CMCs. Okay. It's a process mm -hmm. where you wind fibers around a mold right. to create a strong, yeah. lightweight structure. That's amazing. So it's like they're building materials yeah. atom by atom. Yeah. This is all so impressive. Pretty cool, huh? But let's not forget about the human element. Yeah. One paper explores how to design better interfaces Okay. for rehabilitation robots. Rehabilitation robots. These are robots that help people recover yes. from injuries or disabilities. Right? Exactly. And the way humans interact with these robots yeah. is crucial for their effectiveness. Absolutely. The research focuses on making these interfaces right. intuitive, mm -hmm. engaging, yeah. and even motivating. So it's not just about making the robot work. Right. It's about making it easy and enjoyable yeah. for people to use. What kind of things are they doing to achieve that? They're incorporating elements okay. of gamification and virtual reality oh. into the interface. Wow. I imagine instead of just going through repetitive exercises, right. you could immerse yourself mm -hmm. in a virtual world, right. completing tasks or playing games that challenge you. Oh, wow. Physically and mentally. That sounds way more fun than traditional physical therapy. A lot more engaging. Yeah. It's a great example of yeah. how technology can not only assist us, right. but also make things more engaging and enjoyable. Absolutely. Speaking of technology that seems straight out of science fiction, okay. one paper dives into the world of droplet dynamics. Droplet dynamics. Basically, how tiny droplets behave oh, right. when they hit a surface. Okay. I know it sounds kind of random. It does. But it actually has a ton of real-world applications. It does. You're right. Yeah. Understanding droplet behavior okay. is crucial for things like right. inkjet printing, uh, spray painting, mm. agricultural spraying, right. even medical inhalers. Wow. Think about it the way a droplet spreads, right. bounces, mm -hmm. or breaks apart yeah. can affect everything from the quality of a printed image oh, wow. to the effectiveness of a medication. So they're studying something yeah. that seems really small, yeah, but has huge implications. Huge implications. What kind of methods do they use to study these tiny droplets? They use high-speed cameras. Oh, wow. And sophisticated image analysis techniques. So they can slow it down and see what happens. They can Awesome. to capture and analyze mm. the intricate movements mm. of droplets yeah. as they collide with different surfaces. Right. They look at things like the droplet skied, okay. size, and the properties of the surface to understand yeah. how these factors influence mm. what happens upon impact. I can only imagine what those high-speed videos look like. They're pretty cool. Yeah. It's amazing how something so seemingly mundane can be so complex and fascinating me, when you look at it closely. It is. Speaking of complexity, <laughs> this next paper tackles a topic that's been in the news a lot lately. Okay. Solid state batteries. Solid state batteries. What's the buzz all about? Right. And are they really going to change the world? Solid state batteries have the potential okay. to be a game changer. Mm -hmm. They offer several advantages okay. over traditional lithium ion batteries. Like what? They can store more energy. Right. They're safer. Okay. And they can last longer. So why aren't we all using solid state batteries already? The biggest challenge yeah. is 
finding solid electrolytes okay. that can conduct ions efficiently right. at room temperature. So it's a material science challenge. Exactly. Okay. The researchers in this paper mm -hmm. focus on a promising type okay. of solid electrolyte right. called garnet-type electrolytes. Garnet-type electrolytes. These materials have a unique crystal structure yeah. that allows lithium ions to move through them right. relatively easily. So it's like a super highway for electrons. That's a great analogy. But okay. They're still in the early stages of development. Right. But they hold a lot of promise. Yeah. For the future of batteries. Okay. I can't wait to see what they come up with. Me too. Speaking of the future. Right. One paper explores how machine learning mm -hmm. can be used to predict the right. remaining useful life of aircraft components. Remaining useful life. So basically, they're using AI yeah. to figure out when a part is going to fail. Exactly. Wow. Instead of relying solely on scheduled maintenance, yeah. which might not always catch problems early on, right. this approach uses machine learning mm -hmm. to analyze mm -hmm. sensor data right. and look for patterns that indicate a component is wearing out. So it's like a crystal ball for airplane parts? In a way, yes. That's so cool. By continuously monitoring sensor data right, and using machine learning to analyze trends, mm. airlines can optimize maintenance schedules, okay. reduce downtime, right. and most importantly, yeah. enhance safety. So it's better on all fronts. It's a huge win for everyone. That's incredible to see how machine learning is impacting so many different areas of engineering. It really is. Okay, let's dive into another paper that draws inspiration from nature. Okay. This one is all about creating bio-inspired sensors. Bio-inspired sensors. That mimic the incredible sensing abilities of insects. Insects are amazing. Yeah. At sensing their environment. Yeah. They use their antenna. Right. To detect everything. Yeah. From temperature and humidity to yeah. chemicals and air currents. Wow. The researchers in this paper are trying to replicate that incredible sensitivity okay. by creating sensors right. that mimic the structure and function of insect antenna. So they're building sensors that are like tiny artificial antenna? Exactly. That's so cool. What could we use these bio-inspired sensors for? The potential applications are vast. Imagine sensors that can detect mm -hmm. tiny amounts of pollutants in the air. Okay. Identify specific biomarkers right. for early disease detection. Oh, wow or monitor subtle changes in manufacturing processes to ensure quality control. It's like having a superpower for sensing. It is pretty amazing. Yeah, it's amazing how nature can inspire such incredible innovations. Absolutely. There's so much we can learn from the natural world. Okay, let's shift gears and talk about something that sounds a bit more intense. Okay. Hypersonic flight. Hypersonic flight. We're talking about vehicles yes. that travel at more than five times the speed of sound. That's right. Greater than Mach 5. I can't even imagine how fast that is. It's incredibly fast. Yeah. Hypersonic flight has huge potential okay. for both military and civilian applications. Like what? Think about aircraft mm -hmm. that could travel across the globe yeah. in just a few hours. Wow. Or spacecraft that could reach orbit more efficiently. It sounds incredible. Yeah, but I imagine the technical challenges are enormous. They are. Designing a vehicle that can withstand those speeds right. and the intense heat generated yeah. by friction with the atmosphere absolutely, must yeah. be incredibly difficult. It is. One of the biggest challenges yeah. is developing effective thermal protection systems okay. to prevent the vehicle from burning up. Right. This paper explores a new type okay. of thermal protection system okay. that uses a material okay. called carbon nanotube bucky paper. Bucky paper? Right. What in the world is that? It's a thin, flexible sheet made from carbon nanotubes. Carbon nanotube? Tiny tubes of carbon atoms okay. that are incredibly strong right. and lightweight. Okay. Bucky paper has exceptional thermal properties, okay. making it an ideal material for protecting hypersonic vehicles right. from the intense heat of atmospheric reentry yeah. or high-speed flight. So it's like a super strong heat-resistant shield yeah. made from tiny tubes of carbon. That's it. That's incredible. It's amazing what you can achieve yeah. when you work at the nanoscale. All right, let's switch gears okay. and talk about something a bit more down-to-earth. Uh, fracture mechanics. Fracture mechanics, okay. I know it sounds a bit dry. Yeah. But it's actually crucial it for understanding how structures behave under stress yeah. and preventing catastrophic failures. Fracture mechanics helps us understand right. how cracks form mm -hmm. and 
grow in materials. Right. Which is essential. Yeah. For ensuring the safety and reliability yeah. of everything. Right. From bridges and airplanes right. to buildings and medical implants. So they're basically studying how things break. Essentially, yes. Okay. But it's a lot more complex than yeah. it sounds. Yeah. This paper explores a computational technique okay. called the Extended Finite Element Method. The Extended Finite Element Method. Or XMM, which right. allows engineers ML. to simulate how cracks propagate in materials. So instead of building a bridge and then waiting to see if it cracks, yeah. they can use XFEM to simulate different scenarios. They can. And identify potential weak points. That's it. That's incredible. XM allows engineers to incorporate cracks right. directly into their models. Right. Providing a more realistic simulation okay. of how a structure will behave. Under stress. Under stress. Okay. It's a powerful tool for designing safer yeah. and more durable structures. Okay, this next paper is about something we're all familiar with. All right. Wearable sensor. Wearable sensors. But these aren't your typical fitness trackers. This like, research is about developing a yeah. new type of flexible sensor right. that can be worn on the skin yeah, okay. to measure things like heart rate, okay. respiration, mm. and even body temperature. So wearable sensors are already transforming healthcare. Yeah. But these new flexible sensors mm. offer even greater comfort and accuracy. So they're more comfortable and more accurate. The researchers used a material called polydimethylsiloxine. Polydimethylsiloxine. Or PDMS. Okay. Which is often used in contact lenses. Oh. It's super flexible. Yeah. And conforms to the contours of the skin. So you can barely even feel it. Making it very comfortable to wear. So what kind of applications do they envision for these sensors? They could be used by athletes. Okay. To monitor their performance. Right. By patients with chronic conditions. Okay. To track their vital signs at home. Mm -hmm. Or even by doctors. Yeah. To remotely monitor their patients. So it really opens up a lot of possibilities for monitoring people's health. It does. It's yeah. all about giving people yeah. more control over their health and well-being. That's amazing. I can't wait to see what the future holds for wearable technology. It is a fascinating field. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about something that's crucial for the future of energy. Okay. High performance capacitors. Also known as supercapacitors or ultra capacitors. Ultra capacitors. I know it's a mouthful. It is. But what exactly are they? Supercapacitors are energy storage devices. Okay. That can deliver quick bursts of energy. Okay. When needed. Okay. They're like batteries on steroids. Okay. They can charge and discharge much faster. Wow, so they're much faster than batteries. Much faster. Wow. Making them ideal for things like yeah. regenerative braking in vehicles, Okay. power backup systems, mm. and even energy harvesting technologies. So they're like batteries that can deliver a quick jolt of energy That's it. when you need it most. That's it. But what makes these supercapacitors so special? One of the key factors yeah. is the electrode material. Okay. The researchers in this paper mm -hmm. developed new electrode material okay. using a combination okay. of graphene and metal oxides. Graphene. Okay. Graphene is a single layer of carbon atoms okay. arranged in a honeycomb lattice. And it has incredible electrical conductivity. So it's like a super highway for electrons? Exactly. Wow. By okay. combining graphene with metal oxides. Right. Which have excellent electrochemical properties. Okay. They created a supercapacitor. Right. With impressive energy storage capabilities. That's amazing. It is. Okay. I'm ready for another exciting paper. Okay. What's next on our list? This one takes us back to the world of robotics. Okay. But with a twist. Okay. It's all about modular robotics. Modular robotics. Which is a new approach to designing robots yeah. that are much more versatile and adaptable. Modular robotics. So yeah. it's like building robots with Legos. That's a great analogy. Okay. Traditional robots are often designed for specific tasks. Mm -hmm. But modular robots yeah. are built from interchangeable components right. that can be easily reconfigured. Okay. To perform different functions. So you can kind of mix and match. You can imagine a robot that can transform from a wheeled platform right. for navigating flat surfaces okay. to a legged robot for tackling rough terrain. That's really cool. All by simply swapping out its modules. Wow. It's like having a robot that can adapt to any situation. That's it. And they're taking it a step further. They are. By incorporating yeah. artificial intelligence or AI right. algorithms right. that allow the robot to learn from right. its experiences mm -hmm. and adapt its behavior accordingly. 
So these robots are not just adaptable, right. they're intelligent. Exactly. That's incredible. It's a glimpse into a future yeah. where robots aren't just tools, right. but intelligent collaborators okay. capable of working alongside humans right. in all sorts of environments. This technology is truly mind-blowing. It really is. Okay, I'm ready to delve into another paper. Awesome. What's up next? This one focuses on a crucial aspect of engineering okay. known as non-destructive testing okay. or NDT. NDT. It's all about inspecting and evaluating mm -hmm. the integrity of materials and structures yeah. without causing any damage. So it's like having x-ray vision for materials. You could think of it that way. Okay. NDT is essential okay. for ensuring safety yeah. and preventing catastrophic failures okay. in everything from bridges and airplanes okay. to pipelines and pressure vessels. Yeah. So they're looking for cracks corrosion yeah. or any other hidden flaws they are. that could compromise the integrity of a structure. Exactly. Okay. And one of the most widely used NDT techniques mm -hmm. is ultrasonic testing. Okay. Which uses high frequency sound waves okay. to detect flaws within a material. So they're using sound to find these flaws. They are. That's really interesting. This particular paper explores a new approach okay. to ultrasonic testing. Okay. That uses laser-generated ultrasound. Laser-generated ultrasound. That's right. So instead of sending out sound waves, yeah. they're using a laser. Exactly. To find these flaws. Laser beams instead of sound waves. Okay. Now we're talking. Now we're talking. So instead of using a traditional ultrasonic transducer, mm -hmm. which has to be in direct contact with the material, right? they're using a laser to generate the sound waves. That's amazing. It's incredibly precise. Yeah. This technique allows you to inspect complex shapes, okay. reach hard-to-access areas, mm -hmm. and even perform inspections remotely. Wow. It's a real game-changer for non-destructive testing. That's super cool. Okay. Okay, this next paper focuses on sensors that can detect teeny tiny amounts of pollutants in the air and water. Yeah, these are super important. We're talking about sensors that are so sensitive they can detect parts per billion of harmful substances. That's right. That's like finding a single grain of sand in an Olympic-sized swimming pool. It's pretty amazing technology. So how do they work? These new sensors are based on nanomaterials, okay. which have incredibly high surface area and unique electronic properties right. that make them extremely sensitive to specific target molecules. So they're kind of like little molecular detectives? You could think of it that way. Yeah. They can sniff out even the smallest traces of these harmful substances. So where would you use sensors like these? All sorts of places. Okay. You could use them to monitor water quality in rivers and lakes. Right. Detect air pollution in cities. Okay. Or even monitor industrial processes. Oh. To make sure yeah. they're not releasing harmful chemicals into the environment. It's really incredible that we can detect those pollutants at such low levels now. Yeah. It's a huge step forward for environmental protection. Okay. One of the biggest challenges we face is climate change. Yeah, that's right. One of these papers explores a technology that could play a key role in mitigating climate change. Okay. Carbon capture and storage. Right. Or CCS. CCS. Can you explain what CCS is? Yeah. So CCS is all about capturing carbon dioxide emissions mm -hmm. from power plants and industrial processes. Okay. And storing them safely underground to prevent them from entering the atmosphere. Okay. And contributing to global warming. So it's like we're putting a filter on those big smokestacks. Exactly. To trap the CO2. That's a great way to think about it. Yeah. I imagine it must be pretty challenging to capture and store that much CO2, though. It is one of the biggest challenges. Yeah. Is finding efficient and cost-effective materials mm -hmm. that can selectively capture CO2 from flue gas. Flue gas. Which is the exhaust gas produced by power plants okay. and other industrial facilities. So it's like we're trying to find a magic sponge yeah. that can soak up all the CO2. That's one way to think about it. This research explores a promising material for carbon capture okay. called Metal Organic Frameworks, or MOFs. MOFs. MOFs are incredibly porous materials with a huge surface area. That's right. Which makes them ideal for trapping CO2 molecules. So they're like tiny cages that can trap the CO2. Yeah, exactly. And researchers have designed these MOFs okay. to have a really strong affinity for CO2, mm -hmm. meaning they can selectively capture it from the flue gas stream. That's really interesting. What's even better is that <laughs> these MOFs can be easily regenerated. That's right. 
meaning they can be reused multiple times. It's a really promising technology. Yeah, it sounds like it could be a really big part of tackling climate change. Definitely. Okay, this next paper explores how microfluidics is being used to develop personalized drug delivery systems. Microfluidics is a fascinating field. Yeah, and personalized medicine sounds like something straight out of science fiction. It does. So can you tell me a little bit more about how this works? Yeah, so microfluidics is all about manipulating tiny volumes of fluids. Okay. We're talking droplets that are smaller than the width of a human hair. That's tiny. It is. And the researchers in this paper yeah. developed a tiny microfluidic chip Okay. that can actually encapsulate individual doses of medication wow. within those microscopic droplets. So you could have your entire medication regimen it could. on this tiny chip. Stored on a tiny chip. <laughs> That's mind-blowing. But how do you control when and how much medication is released? That's the really cool part. Okay. The chip also contains sensors and actuators okay. that allow doctors to precisely control the release of those medication droplets. Wow. They can adjust the dosage okay. and the timing right. to meet the patient's specific needs. That's incredible. Ensuring optimal effectiveness and minimizing side effects. It's like having a tiny little pharmacist inside your body. Exactly. A personalized pharmacist. This technology is truly revolutionary. It is a game changer. Yeah. Okay. What else have we got? All right. So this one takes 3D printing to a whole new level. Okay. It's called 4D printing. 4D printing. It's right. I thought 3D printing was already pushing the limits. Well, 4D printing takes it even further. So what is 4D printing? It involves using special materials okay. that can change their shape okay. or properties over time okay. in response to external stimuli. External stimuli, like what? Like temperature, okay. light, okay. or even moisture. Wow, so you're telling me they're printing objects that can transform themselves. Essentially, yes. That's straight out of a science fiction movie. It is pretty amazing. But how does it work? Well, this research focused on using a special type of shape memorial polymer okay. that can be 3D printed Right. And then programmed okay. to change its shape when right. exposed to heat. So you print something. Yeah. And then you heat it up. You heat it up. And it changes shape. It transforms into something else. That's mind-blowing. What There's could you even use this for? All sorts of things. Imagine yeah. self-assembling furniture. Oh. Wow. Medical implants that can adjust to the body's shape. Okay. Even buildings that can change their structure. Wow. To adapt to different weather conditions. This technology is absolutely incredible. It is. It's exciting stuff. Okay, what's next? This paper explores the world of computational fluid dynamics. Computational fluid dynamics? Or CFD. CFD. What is that? So CFD uses powerful computer simulations oh, okay. to understand how fluids behave. Fluids. You mean like water and air? Exactly. Things like water and air. Okay. And why is that important? Well, it's... Essential for designing all sorts of things. Okay, like what? Airplanes. Okay. Cars. Mm -hmm. Wind turbines. Right. Even medical devices. Oh, wow. So they're basically creating virtual wind tunnels on a computer. You can think of it that way. Okay, that sounds incredibly efficient. Uh, but I imagine it can't be that easy. It's not. To simulate how fluids behave. Fluids can be pretty complex. Yeah. And one of the biggest challenges in CFD okay. is accurately modeling Turbulence. Turbulence, right, because it's unpredictable. It is. It's that chaotic, unpredictable motion of fluids. Right, and that can have a big impact on things like airplanes and ships and cars. Absolutely. It can significantly impact their performance. So how do they model turbulence? Well, this paper explores a new approach Okay. that combines traditional CFD techniques with machine learning. Machine learning, again... I'm sensing a theme here. It's a powerful tool. Yeah, it really seems like it's changing everything. It really is. So how do they use machine learning to model turbulence? So they train a machine learning algorithm right. on huge amounts of experimental data. Okay. And this allows them to create a turbulence model that's incredibly accurate. Wow. So it's like they've taught a computer to be a fluid dynamics expert. Exactly. That's amazing. Okay, I think we have time for one more paper. All right, this last one focuses on tribology. Tribology, what is tribology? Tribology is the study of friction wear and lubrication. Okay, and why is that important? It's all about making things run smoother and more efficiently. So less friction. Less friction. Things last longer. Exactly, and they use less energy. What kind of things do they do to reduce friction? Well, this paper explores a technique called surface texturing. Surface texturing. 
right. which involves creating tiny patterns on surfaces okay. to reduce friction. So instead of having a perfectly smooth surface, right. you add in these little bumps and grooves. You got it. It seems counterintuitive. It does, but those microscopic textures yeah. can actually trap lubricant. Oh, Okay. Reduce the contact area between surfaces. Okay. And even change the way fluids flow between surfaces. And that all adds up to less friction. It all helps to reduce friction and wear. It's incredible how such tiny changes can make such a big difference. It really is. Sometimes the smallest things can have the biggest impact. That's a great point. And I think that's a perfect place to wrap up our deep dive today. It sounds good. This has been an incredible journey. It has. Through the world of cutting edge engineering research. There's so many fascinating discoveries. I'm amazed by the ingenuity. Yeah. The creativity. Yeah, absolutely. And the sheer brilliance of these researchers. Absolutely. And it makes you feel hopeful for the future. I know. It really does give you hope for the future. Yeah. So to all of you listening out there keep exploring keep learning keep that curiosity going and never stop being curious about the world around you